to Spiritual Calisthenics. Today, on April 3rd, we celebrate the Sunday of St. John of the Ladder, St. John Climacus. Now, this uh, gospel passage is so important that we're not going to focus so much on uh, St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews uh, in as much as we are looking for uh, sort of a, a deeper understanding of the gospel. So, at that time, a man came to Jesus kneeling and saying, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a dumb spirit, and wherever it seizes him, it clap dashes him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And Jesus answered, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has he had this? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have pity on us and help us. Now, this is a very, very important God. And as we are in St. John of the Ladder, we are looking at the Ladder of Divine Ascent, in which this master work of St. John, he teaches us how to combat the passions and how to acquire virtues. And that can only be done through faith. Now, this demon-possessed boy is an allegory for all of us because this boy has had this demon that has rendered him mute, has made him dumb, since childhood. And this is an allegory for all of us. And it has tried to destroy him by throwing him into fire and to water. The fathers of the church teach us that the fire are the passions. And if we picture a little candle, and we have the candle's wick at a proper height, it's going to burn properly, the smoke will go directly up, it gives the light that it's supposed to, but if the wick is too big, it burns out of control and it has the danger of becoming a conflagration. And so it is with all of the passions, whether it's hunger, whether it's uh, tiredness, whatever it may be, when it is out of control, it can destroy us. And so that is the fire, that when we burn with our passions, this is what it means, to burn out of control. And the water represents anxiety. When we are feeling like we're drowning, like I just can't catch a breath because I'm drowning in my worries, my responsibilities, whether it's to work or family or children, whatever it may be, we feel like we just can't catch a breath. And so these are the two ways that the demons try to destroy us, whether it is through our passions or whether it is through our anxiety, our worries. And as such, these things have been combating us since our childhood. So all of us are represented in this young boy. And the father asked Jesus Christ's disciples to heal him, and they weren't able to do it. They were not able to pray and get rid of this demon. And this is important for us, and Jesus Christ is going to explain why in a moment. But if you can do anything, have pity on us and help us. So the father is asking Jesus Christ to help his son. And Jesus Christ said, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. In other words, it is possible for this man to help his son. And it is possible for the son to be helped through his own works. In other words, this is something that we don't have to go to Christ to try to magically wave away. This is something that we have the power to accomplish on our own. All things are possible to him who believes. Now, what does that mean? It means to have faith. Jesus Christ tells us that if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, then we will say to this mountain, move, and it will move hence. But this is only possible with faith. It doesn't take a lot, but it shows just how little we have. And this is made manifest by the Father's response. The Father says, I believe, help my unbelief. 
How many of us have that in us? How many of us have that feeling of, I believe in God, I believe in the miracles, I believe that he can do these things for me, and yet I don't. In my heart of hearts, I don't. If I did, my life would be different. If I really believed, if I really had faith, my life would be different, but I don't. And so the Father's prayer is our prayer. Help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, You dumb and deaf spirit. Dumb meaning making the boy unable to speak, to pray for himself. And deaf, meaning he's unable to hear help that is coming to him. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer and fasting. Now we get to the crux of it. Now we get to why this is on the Sunday of St. John of the Ladder. Prayer and fasting is how we combat the demon that wants to destroy us by our passions and by our anxiety. Prayer and fasting. In other words, we cannot get rid of our passions by waving a magic wand and just suddenly, boom, they're gone. We can't get rid of our anxiety by pretending that they don't exist, by just trying to, to live in a separate reality. Our reality is that we live in a world of anxieties and worries. And we have to deal with our passions every single day. We can't just ignore them. And so the only way to deal with this is prayer and fasting. Now, what does that mean? So regarding prayer, prayer is something that's critical to us. And there are three types of prayer that we have to do. The first is corporate prayer, where we gather together. St. Jerome says, one Christian is no Christian, and so therefore we are made stronger together. You can't blow out uh, 30 candles quite as easily as you could blow out a single candle. You can't break a bundle of sticks the same way that it is easy to break a single stick. There is much more strength in number. We are a Christian community, a Christian body. And as such, that strengthens us. It's harder to have anxiety and worries when we are uplifted by other people. It is harder to be destroyed by our passions when other people are praying for us and helping us. The second kind of prayer is private prayer. The prayer that we read in private to our Heavenly Father, such as the Lord's Prayer, our evening prayers, our morning prayers. The prayers that have been prescribed for us by the church so that we can better understand how we ought to pray. So when Jesus Christ gave us the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, etc., he shows us exactly how we ought to pray because each line of the Lord's Prayer is an archetype of every kind of prayer. Prayers of doxology, prayers of asking for help, prayers of asking for deliverance, prayers of trying to understand God's will. All of our prayers should mirror those kinds of sentiments. For example, a 10-year-old boy who is told to pray before his basketball game, he's probably going to pray, God help me win this game. Now that's unfortunately not a good prayer. It's not a prayer that the boy should be praying because after all, it gives us the context that, well, then God's going to listen to my prayer versus another person's prayer because the 10-year-old boy on the other team is probably praying the exact same thing. So who is God listening to? if that is the way prayer is supposed to work, in kind of a wish sort of thing, like a genie, like, oh, God, grant my wish. But that's not the purpose of prayer, is it? And so when we read our private prayers, it helps model us so that the boy's prayer might better be, God, let us have a good time. God, let us be safe. God, let us all perform to the best of our ability so that both we and the opposing team can have a good time and may the best man win. So private prayer informs how we ought to pray. 
teaches us. They're like training wheels on our bike, which leads us to the final prayer, personal prayer. So many times we only pray to God when things are going wrong. But the reality is we're supposed to be treating God like our best friend. We don't just talk to our best friend when things are going wrong. We talk to our best friend when things are going right. We want our friend to know what's going on in our life. And so we communicate, sometimes daily with our friend, to say, hey, I just tried this new restaurant, it was awesome. Or hey, I just read this new book, I really want you to hear about it. This is the kind of relationship we're supposed to have with God, both the good and the bad. So many times we only come to God when things are going terrible in our life. That's not really a good friendship. It's not really a good relationship if we only come to the person when we are in need. God, who gave everything to us, who died for us on the cross, wants to have an intimate, real, authentic relationship with us. Prayer is the vehicle by which that happens. And when we have prayer, when we have that relationship with God, to know that we are with him on all things, it's very hard to have anxiety. It's very hard to have those worries that feel like they're drowning us because we're not alone. This is why in the image of Jesus Christ walking on the water, he shows us that we too can walk on the waters when he has Peter walk on the water with him. So we are able to stand on top of all that anxiety, all that water that is seeking to drown us with worry. We can walk on top of it with him if we have faith. How do we develop that faith? Through prayer relational dialogue with God. The second half is fasting. And what's the purpose of fasting? Oftentimes during Great Lent, we think that it's just about looking at the nitty gritty little details. Okay, you know, no egg, no dairy, you know, make sure that there's nothing in this thing. Well, that's not the point. The point of fasting is self-control. One of the first steps of the ladder is dealing with our hunger. In other words, when we are able to control our stomachs, our physical problems, we are much better able to deal with spiritual problems. It's about learning self-control. It's about acquiring discipline. Fasting isn't the goal unto itself. It is a tool. It is a way that we are able to get where we want to go. Fasting has a couple of wonderful benefits. For example, when I am a little bit hungry, science has shown our synapses in our brain move faster. We're able to think quicker. And as such, when we're dealing with spiritual warfare with an enemy that is trying to, to trick us, to deceive us, to make us mute and deaf, we're able to think on our feet to be like a boxer looking for those blows that are coming. When we are just a little bit hungry, we're able to do that. And so fasting by keeping ourselves not quite full, but about 90% full, allows us to do that. The second aspect is, of course, is that, as we all know from Thanksgiving dinner, is that when we eat to excess, we feel sluggish, we feel weak, we feel sleepy. We're not quite as able to do the things that we want to do. And so fasting helps us accomplish that by not being sluggish, by not being uh, sleepy. And so we're better able to get into the arena of spiritual warfare. These two things, prayer, to have a relationship with God, fasting, to learn self-control, allows us to combat these demons, the passions and our anxieties, to be able to walk on top of the water, to lead a life that is measured and in control so that we are the ones controlling our destiny, so that we can walk towards God and acquire virtues. We cannot acquire love or patience or prudence or any of the great virtues of God until we have put away the evil in our life. So Jesus Christ telling his disciples this sort of demon can only be combated by prayer and fasting is to show us that there is no quick getting rid of this. This is the daily struggle of our life. It is something that, like this young boy, we've had since childhood. 
and we see how the evil one is trying to destroy us, how to rob us. But if we have faith, even faith the size of a mustard seed, we can say to that mountain, and that mountain is not talking about a physical mountain, it's talking about these passions, these anxieties, these things that seem insurmountable. We can say, go into the lake, go away from it. We can move mountains with faith the size of a mustard seed. Let us acquire that faith through prayer and fasting so that we too can no longer be deaf and dumb, but walk with God. And how did God show us his faith and love for us? That is when we finish this gospel. They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he would not have anyone know of it. And he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. In other words, for our passions, for our worries, he dies for us, and he rises for us, because this is the vehicle of our salvation. The cross, as we discussed last week, is the vehicle of our salvation. All of this is possible because Christ died for us, that we can commune with him in this way, that the separation that Adam and Eve accomplished is now put back in its rightful place by Christ our God. I pray that you've enjoyed today's spiritual calisthenics, that you have a blessed and wonderful day. I apologize for the last few days of not having spiritual calisthenics. We had some issues with uh, our recording. I bless you. Have a wonderful day.